Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Misty Bennett. And I'm Rob Olson. As you may notice, no Livius again. We gave him the slip, and uh, we're doing another episode without him. Uh, And this is an interview with Mark Olshaker, the author of uh, The Killer Shadow. Here's a quick bio from him. Mark Olshaker is an Emmy Award-winning documentary filmmaker and author of 10 nonfiction books and five novels, including Einstein's Brain and The Edge. His books with former FBI special agent and criminal profiling pioneer John Douglas, beginning with Mindhunter and most recently Law and Disorder, have sold millions of copies and have been translated into many languages. Mindhunter is now a dramatic series on Netflix, directed by David Fincher. He and his wife Carolyn, an attorney, live in Washington, D.C. That they do. And uh, last week, Rob, we, we reviewed The Killer's Shadow. You can check out that episode. But today, we were lucky enough to interview Mark Olshaker. And what a fantastic interview it was. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us. I have to imagine that it's a, it's a busy time promoting a new book and everything. So we appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having me, Rob. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you. So one of the things that we do when we, inter- when we review a book is we always like to give the author that we're, we're talking to the opportunity to kind of represent the book in their own words, because we just gave our impressions. So do you have a quick uh, summary for, for our listeners about what The Killer's Shadow is? Well, The Killer's Shadow is uh, a book in a series that I've done with John Douglas, the FBI's behavioral profiling pioneer and one of the uh, one of the innovators of modern criminal investigative analysis. And this particular one is unfortunately very relevant today. It's about the FBI's hunt for a white supremacist serial killer named Joseph Paul Franklin. And uh, he was operating in the 70s and 80s. And uh, he was a very unusual serial killer in that he moved around a lot, Uh, He did not have a particular individual victim of preference. His generalized individual, his generalized victim of preference was uh, Jews, black people and mixed race couples. And he was on a self-styled mission to foment a race war and change the character of the United States. Uh, And unfortunately, he has become uh, a hero and a spiritual father to much of the uh, right-wing extremist uh, groups that are operating today, which we can talk more about if you like. Um, So this is both uh, a mystery story, it's a warning, if you will, and it's a deep dive into the mind of a particularly perverse kind of serial killer. Perfect, and um, as a follow-up, what what do you hope the average reader will, will take away from reading this book? as you've described it? Well, that's an interesting question, Misty. With all of the uh, books that John and I have written together, beginning with Mindhunter, which became uh, a Netflix series that we're very proud of, uh, we first of all want to entertain, we want to interest and engage readers. Uh, We want them to understand uh, what criminal justice and criminal investigative analysis and profiling is all about. In effect, we want to let people understand and get more of an insight into why people do the things they do. You know, I think this leads into a question which I'm asked frequently, which is, what is the fascination with true crime? And I think probably the fascination with true crime has to do with the fact that it is really about the human condition, as we call it in literature, a a, a subject I'm sure you all talk about constantly in your show, but it's the human condition writ large. It's the human condition at the extremes, uh, people doing the things that most of us constrain ourselves. We all have feelings of love, hate, jealousy, revenge, envy, resentment, whatever, but we write about the people who act on them, who don't have uh, any constraints, who don't have any empathy, who don't have feelings for other people or concern for other people. Uh, Everything is about them. Uh, And we think it's both important uh, to write about them and interesting. I think if you read The Killer's Shadow, you will understand how somebody like Joseph Paul Franklin became the kind of person he is. Uh, He was. uh, Fortunately, he's been executed since uh, uh, in the last several years. 
But this is what we want to write about. We want people to understand why these aberrational people do the things they do. We want them to understand that they're not like us. Why? And uh, we think it's very important to be aware that these kind of people are out there. Um, that's awesome. And kind of similar question, but with a different spin to it. With uh, the books that you that you write about, um, these criminals and um, why they do what they do, is this also intended for uh, or uh, possibly useful for people in law enforcement? And if, if it is, like, it, would it be in a different way than how you would expect civilians to take information away from it? Well, that's a very interesting question. We've uh, we've been very careful over the years not to sort of give away anything, if you will, not to give away uh, secrets. Uh, <laughs> uh, most mostly, uh, that's not that's not an issue. But uh, I think uh, since people like John Douglas and his colleagues at the FBI uh, Academy in Quantico, Virginia, they saw a lot of things that ordinary uh, police officers, sheriffs, uh, deputies, investigators don't see a lot of. They were sort of the national specialists. So I think um, any uh, law enforcement official reading this book probably could get some perspective and a wider uh, perspective and understanding of what these people were like. I mean, if you uh, go to back to some of the uh, events in our unfortunate events in our recent past, like Charlottesville and see why did that happen? Who was involved? Why were they, uh, why were these mostly young men, white young men marching down the street with uh, tiki torches, uh, chanting Jews will not replace us and blood and soil, which was one of the prime slogans of Nazi Germany. And we tried to explain why these people are the way they are. And then the big, the big challenge, and this is one that we've, I'll admit we haven't really solved, is how do you determine which of those people, which of those people who belong to the Ku Klux Klan or the National States Rights Party or the American Nazi Party or the National Socialist White People's Party or any of the number of uh, groups that uh, have names like that, uh, the Proud Boys now, whatever, how do you determine which of those people are just going to march and proclaim slogans and complain and be resentful of people who are others and which ones are going to do what Joseph Paul Franklin did and actually move from the rhetoric to the violence. And that's really the challenge that we faced. Um, you know, normally I, uh, I know your readers can't see, uh, can't see me, but you can normally when I uh, do these kind of presentations, I can do it off the top of my head. <laughs> but Joseph Paul Franklin was such a prolific serial killer. He operated in so many different methods and over so many different eras that I've had my research assistant, uh, Anne Hennigan, write up charts for me so that I can keep track of them all because I don't want to make a mistake. And wow. since, and since the victims are really so important to us. And what we do is for the victims. I don't want to take a chance on confusing or disrespecting any of the victims of, uh, of this monster. So I'm glad you said that because, and we called it out in the, the review um, was, I want to, I want to say again that you, the dedication in the beginning of the book was, was beautiful. And I think it, it's one of the, I, I like a true crime type of book like this where it's obvious that it's not glorifying the bad person it is absolutely doing justice to the people who are victims but then also like you like it's it's very obviously a theme that you're raising awareness about why these types of things happen so um the dedication it's funny because when i read the book i i saw it but going back after i finished reading the book i feel like the dedication was even more impactful having read everything that happened well, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Rob, because that is really what's most important to us. John and I have become uh, actually very close personally with a number of families of, uh, of murder victims over the years and, and crime survivors. And 
they are the ones who are the real heroes. They are the ones who are really important. And the one thing, you know, one of the things people ask all the time is, well, what's the relationship between true crime that we write about and uh, and uh, crime fiction or hybrids like the Mindhunter television series? And one of the things we say is the one thing we cannot abide is any time that the perpetrator, the serial killer, the repeat predator is made into any kind of hero or glamorized in any way. And, you know, we owe a lot of this genre, let's be honest, to Tom Harris and uh, Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs. But the <laughs> one thing we do object to is this kind of glorification of Hannibal Lecter. Um, yes, he's a boogeyman, but, uh, you know, let's let's be honest, if any uh, if any serial killer were as brilliant as he is, uh, he would find another line of work because uh, <laughs> the one thing we can say for sure without any fear of contradiction is that two things are operating simultaneously in the psyche of each of these serial killers or repeat predators we're talking about, which is a deep-seated feeling of inadequacy uh, on one side and feelings of grandiosity and entitlement on the other. And these are warring with each other. And the connection between the triangular connection between them is resentment. And uh, this is what you see in somebody like Joseph Paul Franklin. This is what you see in the modern uh, extremists. And I will go so far as to say, I think I've just described. You know, and I would say that this applies to any member of QAnon or any of these right wing uh, conspiracy groups uh, and, and it, it, you know, extreme left wing groups, too, although the problem in right now seems to be uh, on the right wing. Um, you know, I think one of the interesting things is people like me who have sort of grown up with parents who taught tolerance is that when I hear a politician uh, use a line, use a phrase like diversity, I think, gee, that's a good thing. That's really nice. Um, when these people hear diversity, that translates to not me, somebody else. And that's part of the where part of the resentment comes from, I think. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like that there was uh, one of the things I appreciated about the book was that there were themes that were were pretty clear throughout and and what you just said was was one of them and honestly one of the things that i think helped me helped carry me through reading the book was um not just explaining like what happened and why but also like why it was important um i i feel like and i wish i could think of an, an example off the top of my head but um it feels like uh there was extra care taken to contextualize why it's important that um, you know, losing sight in one eye made this person feel inadequate. And then that drove them down a specific road or, or something like that. So um, that struck me as, as, as almost like there was extra effort to make sure people understood not just the history of it, but also the impact of, of those things going forward. Well, that's a very, that's also a very interesting observation, Rob. And uh, for those readers, uh, presumably <laughs> Almost all who haven't yet uh, had a chance to pick up the book. Joseph Paul Franklin was born in 1950 in uh, rural Alabama. When he was a very young boy, he and his uh, brother were playing with a uh, window blind and the spring snapped and hit him in the eye. Uh, he was severely injured. He was taken to the hospital by his uh, mother. Uh, they treated him and he was told to and she was told to bring him back at a certain period of time which she didn't do um, i might add that both of his parents were very neglectful and abusive he came from a very dysfunctional background which is something we see in many if not most of these uh, serial killers uh, you know which gets us into the whole issue of nature versus na nurture, and in most cases, it's a combination of both. It certainly was in Joseph Paul Franklin's case. But so what does he do when he's practically blind in one eye? He compensates. He compensates by 
uh, becoming uh, by becoming interested in guns and interested in rifles, and he becomes a crack shot. Um, now, this is interesting because you can compare this with another friend of mine, uh, Larry Schiller. Uh, Larry was uh, a close uh, was a close uh, associate of my uh, late friend Norman Mailer, and was the one who set up, among other things. Uh, his great book, The Executioner's Song, one of the great true crime books of all time. Larry also had a um, serious accident that left him blind in one eye as a child. Um, but instead of going the route that Joseph Paul Franklin did, he became an expert photographer. Uh, he, he's sold his pictures among other things that Larry's done, he sold his pictures for thousands and thousands of dollars. So the point is, you can go either way with this kind of handicap. Joseph Paul Franklin uh, found it empowering to be able to compensate for his uh, for his injury by becoming a crack shot, and that was one of his main means of killing people was uh, was through sniping. Um, but I don't want to de-emphasize all of the other influences on his life, the grinding poverty, the physical and mental abuse uh, from his parents, the fact that he grew up in a very uh, hate-filled racist environment and uh, didn't feel very adequate in himself. And then when at age 16, he discovered Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, it's like it all came together for him. Ah, I'm not responsible for my own bad situation. And there's ways out of it. There is strength in numbers. There's strength in these people. And I can find people who are inferior to me because I am of the master race. I am not um, a black person. I am not a Jew. I'm not all, any of these inferior people. And I can dedicate my life to something meaningful, which is basically to kill these people, to eliminate them and to foment a race war. And what's interesting is uh, uh, many decades later, um, Dylan Roof in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, yeah. shoots up a black church and uh, he has the same motivation. He says that uh, he is trying to foment a race war. He feels this is his uh, this is his mission in life. And he had one of the same. Um, he had one of the same reactions uh, in prison that Joseph Paul Franklin did, which is, yeah, you can say you're going to keep me in prison forever. You can say you're going to execute me, but that doesn't really matter because as soon as the race war happens and we win, uh, my people are going to free me anyway, and I'm going to be a hero. So you can see the kind of disordered thinking and sociopathic uh, behavior and, and delusion that... Uh, that this kind of thing can foment. And, you know, I think if I can anticipate your next question, <laughs> Rush, maybe I can and maybe I can't. Uh, one of the reasons that we uh, wrote this book now is uh, when we were trying to decide what was uh, what our uh, what our next book should be. We were sitting in New York with uh, our editor pre COVID, of course, and he said to us, well, which give me a case that's really affected you for a particular reason. That's that's more you know of all the thousands of cases John has done. What, John, what's a case that really has affected you more than any other, or the, more than normal? And we both immediately said Joseph Paul Franklin. And one of the reasons is because a normal and I hate to use that phrase because I don't want to trivialize it, but a normal serial killer has his own interests. He's got some kind of psychosexual hang up and he's looking to uh, manipulate, dominate and control an individual person. Perhaps he has a victim of preference like uh, Ted Bundy. Uh, perhaps he doesn't. Uh, but in any event, and I say he because almost all of them are he's for reasons we can talk about later if you want. But the thing that was so disturbing about Joseph Paul Franklin is this is not just a routine serial killer. This is somebody who has a mission. He's mission oriented. And this is the kind of person who 
being successful as he was for three years, killing at least 22 people across the country and injuring a slew of others, including uh, uh, Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint and uh, civil rights icon. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. <laughs> I'm forgetting Vernon that. Jordan. Vernon Jordan, thank you. Mm -hmm. yes, and, uh, uh, but the other people look up to him, admire him, want to emulate him. Um, in fact, one of the uh, one of the scariest things uh, that we've noticed is, um, and this is at the end of the book. Um, in 1978, uh, a book came out called The Turner Diaries, which was a uh, novel written supposedly by somebody named Andrew MacDonald, who actually was named William Luther Pierce III, and believe it or not, he was a physics professor. And it purports to be the story of how uh, a group of right-wing vigilantes essentially took over the government and uh, got rid of all of the inferior people like African Americans and Jews. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, they have a ceremony in there called, I think, the Day of the Rope, where they kill all the oh. people who uh, are against them. In 1989, um, Pierce wrote another book called Hunter, which is basically about a vigilante who goes about on his own, uh, of his own accord, a lone wolf, if you will, to foment a race war and get rid of the Jews and the blacks who are their dupes. Uh, this book was uh, dedicated to Joseph Paul Franklin. Uh, so this is the kind of reason he's so scary to people like us. And people like uh, Dylan Roof are Joseph Paul Franklin's spiritual children. And uh, when I uh, and Misty, I know that you're in Texas. And when I see a group of uh, uh, without getting too political, when I see a group of Trump supporters surround a bus uh, for the other party, that really scares the hell out of me. Yes, sir. It scares me, too. Um, and I think that so, uh, first of all, you absolutely did anticipate the question that we were going to ask. So, um, Definitely. Sorry. that's, that's wonderful. No, I love it when that happens. Um, but, uh, in our discussion of the book that we recorded yesterday, one of the things that we thought was especially chilling about a person like this is what you were saying is that it's, it's, it's a mantle that can be picked up easily by others. Um, exactly. or it's a person that can be made into an example. Um, as opposed to, and I'm no expert on, on you know serial killers or anything, but like it seems like, um, you know, with other examples of serial killers, they have their own very specific, like genesis, but then also criteria, and then they're also there's so many limitations to, like, um, their victimology that they can't be as prolific as someone who's just like, practically you know a, a large percentage of the population could be a target. Um, so Absolutely. that, that was like, especially chilling about, um, this reading this book and understanding this person. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have somebody like, uh, uh, Dennis, uh, Rader, the BTK serial killer of Wichita, Kansas, who operated for many years and who John eventually, uh, interviewed in prison. He had particular victims in mind. He would follow them. He would uh, decide what to do. He would check out the houses. Um, and his great pleasure it was uh, uh, watching them die. I mean, this was this was his thrill. This was his manipulation, domination, and control. And as perverse as that is, in a way, Joseph Paul Franklin is just as perverse because he had no relationship whatsoever with his victims. He didn't care about it. All he wanted to do was kill them. So he would lie in wait, whether it was uh, outside a railroad trestle where he was hoping to find mixed race couples. In this particular case, he didn't find them, but he found two black teenage boys who were uh, on their way from their grandmother's house to a convenience store. So he just shot them uh, and He's waited outside synagogues to uh, shoot Jews as they came out from services. So the identity, the personality, the relationship between him and his victims 
was essentially non-existent. They were all symbolic to him. They weren't real people. They were just means to his end. Uh, and then the few cases where he did confront them uh, personally, it was with uh, it was just because they happened to get in his way. So you've got somebody who is a sniper who shoots from long distance very well. You've got somebody who can shoot with a handgun uh, from short distance. And you've got somebody who can also set bombs. This is very unusual to have a serial killer who has several different methods uh, that, that he can use. And also what was terrifying is he traveled all over the country. And when he was finally identified um, in uh, Lawrence, Kentucky uh, and captured, he managed to escape. And the terrifying thing at the time was it was believed uh, with a good deal of uh, a, a good deal of reason that he was out to assassinate uh, President Jimmy Carter. Uh, so the Secret Service got involved. And that's how John got involved to begin with, because the FBI Civil Rights Division uh, asked him to do a fugitive assessment and try to figure out where is this guy going to show up? Now, this was 1980. So this was very early in the FBI's behavioral profiling uh, program shortly after they had started doing these uh, uh, prison interviews, which you might have uh, seen something about on uh, on Mind, the Mindhunter television show or what our last book, The Killer Across the Table, was about. So there was a lot at stake, uh, both for the country and for John's program to be able to uh, to be able to find this guy. So uh, he was terrifying in a lot of ways. And uh, he this was his job. This is what he did. Uh, he also happened to be a very prolific bank robber. But uh, the bank robbing was just to support himself while he right. traveled around the country uh, carrying out his so-called mission. And what's very interesting about him is uh, he was involved. He was he had joined all of the uh, the right wing conspiracy uh, and hate groups. He had joined the Ku Klux Klan in Atlanta. He had joined the American Nazi Party, uh, which not, which became evolved into the National Socialist White People's Party in Arlington, Virginia. He joined the National States Rights Party um, and he didn't stay in any of them very long because uh, he thought they were just all talk. They just wanted to talk about their hatred and resentment, but he wanted to actually turn it into action. And that's when he becomes a lone wolf. And that's how when he evolves into the serial killer that he becomes. And that's the scary part, because what makes him or Dylan Roof or somebody like that evolve from somebody who's just this uh, inadequate, uh, losing malcontent into somebody who's going to actually take action and uh, and really hurt people, which is, I think, what we're facing today. Um, and I might add that we're uh, recording this the day before the election. And yeah. uh, regardless of who wins, I think uh, we could be in for uh, for some unfortunate action in the uh, days and weeks coming forward. I would agree with that. And you kind of took my next follow up as well, <laughs> um, because I do think uh, going back to uh, a comment that was already made about the events in Texas over the weekend with the uh, Trump train. And I think also just the uh, where we're at as far as leadership, not taking accountability for speaking against acts of violence such as that, and also the um, what's becoming so popularized is the marginalization of different groups and uh, creating more and more groups of others, which is specifically what Franklin's whole victimology was about. It was they were not human beings to him. They were just targets that happened to belong to a group of who he had identified as an other. And I think we're seeing more and, and more of that since, you know, probably the last election. Misty, you're absolutely right. And I think you brought up an extremely important point, which is, I hope, a theme of our book, which is that words have power. They have tremendous power and they can have a power for good or a power for evil. And I'll give you two completely different examples. 
One is the kind of rhetoric we're hearing today when uh, the president of the United States uh, compliments people who uh, who uh, or encourages people to uh, commit acts of violence, not overtly, but certainly encourages them when there is a um, any reasonable leader, it seems to me, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to get political here, but any reasonable leader, when a group threatens to kidnap the governor of Michigan and the governor of Virginia, um, and that is not roundly condemned by the president of the United right. States, but instead those governors are criticized those words have tremendous power and tremendous significance and tremendous encouragement to certain people. Now, let me give you another example of the power that words have. One of the things that Joseph Paul Franklin used to do is he felt it was his responsibility, part of his Don Quixote white knight, if you will, uh, persona, to protect white womanhood mm -hmm. from ravages of uh, this uh, African-American and Jewish threat. Uh, he would uh, routinely, uh, he, he of course traveled uh, the highways constantly crisscrossing the country, particularly the Eastern half of the country. And he would pick up uh, hitchhikers, uh, young girls, sometimes prostitutes, um, and he would uh, start talking to them in a sense he was profiling them. I mean, we think we think of the lawmen as being the only profilers. Unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, we uh, uh, the bad guys can profile too, and they would profile these girls and young women, and he would talk to them, and he would start asking them about their attitudes about black men, and uh, if they if he became convinced that uh, they had no relationship with black men. That was just great. And he would let them off uh, at uh, their destination or he would invite them back to his hotel. But if he found out that they uh, approved of interracial dating or it had any kind of relationship, intimate or otherwise, with black men, he would kill them. Mm -hmm. So that was part of So it was up to him to be God. He could uh, he could protect them or he could punish them. That was up to him. And that's another uh, very scary concept to me. So I want to say that uh, it's gratifying. You haven't heard our, our review of, of the uh, of the book because we haven't posted it oh, yet. So you didn't have the very positive. But um, a lot of the things that you are calling out as being specifically important about the book are things that we were very enthusiastic about. So um, to me, that that means either we're like particularly insightful or um, more likely, you guys did a great job of of getting your point across very clearly. Uh, because, um, like when you're One saying, way or another, you got it. And then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and so the 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 powers have the words have have power and and all that was one of the things we spent a good amount of time talking about because. Um, yeah, it, it was a. It, the impression was it was a very important message uh, in your book. Um, if it's all right, I'm going to pivot away to kind of a more general writing uh, question. We're a little curious about uh, the the concept of co-authoring in general, um, and especially with this book. And I, I'll admit, um, I haven't read the other books that you've co-authored with John Douglas. Um, so I'm not familiar, but this one definitely had a, like the narrative represents John's specific experiences. Sure. So um, for me, it was not so easy to discern the two different authors voices. So what is the co-authoring experience like for the two of you? Well, that's very interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll back up and say that th this all started years ago. Uh, I don't want to say how many years ago, because <laughs> But uh, I have uh, been a writer, uh, novelist, and nonfiction author for a long time. Uh, I published four novels before I ever met John, uh, thriller novels. And uh, I had been doing writing and producing for Nova, the PBS science series. And around the time that I read Silence of the Lambs, I went to uh, uh, the producer of uh, Nova, 
Paula Apsell at WGBH in Boston. And I said, Paula, I've read this novel, Silence of the Lambs. They're making a movie out of it. Um, if the movie is anywhere near as good as the book, I think it's going to be a big movie. Why don't we do the real story behind these FBI profilers? And uh, I got some uh, resistance at <laughs> first. Uh, I, I was persistent. And this was obviously before 9-11, before profiling became a big thing. And the FBI kind of welcomed us in. So uh, wow. we did a film. We followed John's unit around for quite a while, uh, found some good cases. We uh, produced a film called Mind of a Serial Killer for uh, no PBS Nova, which uh, did very well uh, in the ratings and was nominated for an Emmy. And so uh, I was kind of taken with the whole subject and fascinated by it because, uh, you know, as both a novelist and a nonfiction writer and a documentary filmmaker, you're always looking for great characters. And these guys are all great characters, particularly John Douglas, this um, sort of legendary uh, profiler who just looked like an FBI agent should. And <laughs> Then I don't remember how long it was after that, but either months or a year or so, John called me and he said, you know, I'm getting ready to retire from the FBI now. And do you think anybody would be interested in my story? And I said, well, I certainly am, but let's, <laughs> let's see. And he said, if, if it is, um, would you do it with me? And I said, yeah. So, uh, I talked to my agent. We went up to New York. Um, we presented it. Um, by this time, the movie of Silence of the Lambs had come out. So, uh, um, And the Scott Glenn character was clearly John Douglas, and everybody was interested. So uh, we got a good offer. Uh, we went with uh, Scribner, which is part of Simon & Schuster. Uh, mm -hmm. We did The Mindhunter, which became uh, you know, thrillingly a big bestseller. Uh, and it did well enough so that... Uh, we kept going. And I think uh, Killer Shadow is probably our ninth book together. So to get back to your original question, I think over the years, we've kind of morphed into each other. It's uh, it's you know, <laughs> a seamless partnership. And uh, John, uh, we, we say that John is uh, a detective, you know, uh, masquerading as a writer and I'm a writer masquerading as a detective. <laughs> so, um, uh, we, we work on the stories together. We decide what it's going to be. Um, I'm obviously the primary writer, but, uh, we've gotten into, uh, I think we've developed a narrative form that, um, uh, that does very well and, uh, and kind of represents, uh, a good, a good narrative voice. And, you know, if you say, well, can I write without John at this point? Well, I certainly need his input. But uh, the important thing is that uh, I've had, you know, tutoring from the best for 25 years now. Mm -hmm. So I have. Uh, uh, John said to me recently, he said, you know, you've been with me now longer than any of the profilers who I worked with. So uh, he said, you you probably know as much or more than they do at this point. I think the difference is that um, whatever I may know, John uh, has the, the confidence, the background, the insight to get up in front of a task force group where life and death is on the line and say what he thinks and do it with conviction. Um, I don't know that I'm, I would uh, feel <laughs> that, that level of responsibility. I'm happy writing about it. And so, uh, to get back again, swing back to your original question, um, we can say, in effect, he's Sherlock Holmes and I'm Dr. Watson. That's an excellent way to put it, I would I say. Do. Yeah, I love that. Um, a, a little follow up, more of a, I guess, a compliment, if you don't mind, to um, uh, in what you uh, answered to that question. One of the things we discussed in the review yesterday was um, how exceptional the the co construct of the the book is, and how you laid out everything, the order, the timeline that you went with, and as well as kind of outlining one of the things that we see often on uh, not Mindhunter specifically, but other 
uh, police procedurals and things of that nature, they almost uh, create a kind of magical sense to detective work. And I think what you guys beautifully put together is a combination of the dog and investigating that, that has to occur, as well as the psychology that detectives like John Douglas bring to the table. And then also helping, you know, regular normal read readers like myself understand this is why all these pieces have to come together so that we can, can capture these people, understand these people, and, and get better at investigating. Well, again, Misty, that's, I think that's, that's particularly insightful because that's what John did. He, he and his colleagues studied these people, went into the penitentiaries, tried to uh, correlate for the first time what was going on in the offender's mind before, during, and after the commission of the crime so that they could understand and interpret the uh, physical, forensic, and behavioral uh, clues that came out. But we stress uh, people like John Douglas, they don't catch criminals. They help local police forces, investigators, police officers, detectives catch the criminals. And uh, in the best cases, it always is a collaboration of dogged police work and detective work and uh, interpreting behavioral clues and science and uh, interpreting the uh, physical and scientific evidence. For example, uh, just to stray for a minute to one of our previous books, sometimes uh, you can sort of say what didn't happen. You may not know what happened. You can only say what didn't happen. For instance, in the case of the um, murder of John Benet Ramsey back in the 90s, uh, we still can't say for sure uh, who did it, but we can prove to you forensically, behaviorally, and a combination of uh, all of this, we can prove to you that the uh, Boulder police were wrong, that it was not uh, either of the parents. Uh, um, I've done lectures on this, uh, things like that. So all of this, uh, all, all of this is important. And to go back to something else you said, Misty, uh, when we told our... Uh, uh, editor Matt Harper, that this was the next book we were going to write about. Um, we sort of filled him in on all of the, not the glamorous details, because I don't use words like that, but the exciting parts of it, the uh, scary parts of it, um, the insightful parts of it. What we really hadn't figured on and hadn't really remembered was how incredibly complicated this case was. So uh, our researcher, Ann Hennigan, really did have to put together a very complex timeline for us. And, you know, uh, again, it, we, John and I still have to check it to say, all right, now was so-and-so <laughs> killed before so-and-so? And was the bombing before the sniping? And uh, was he in Cincinnati before he was in uh, uh, Indiana? And, um, and it got really complicated when I, I got really confused because I said, wait a minute, so and so is not the um, is is not the district attorney of whatever county it was, and then suddenly I realized I think we wrote this in the book and I said, oh my God, we have crimes in two different states, but the name of the county is the same. No. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> its own uh, prosecutor, and so you know, if my head reeled as a. Uh, as a writer uh, trying to put this together and John's head reeled just trying to remember, you know, what he'd been through with all this, we can only imagine what the investigators at the time had to go through trying to figure this out, figure whether was there linkage between all these cases around the country? Um, did a bombing and a sniping have anything to do with each other since the victims were similar or were they, were there two people operating uh, against Jews at that point. So you can just see how complicated it gets. And so thank you for saying that we kept it straight because that was probably one of our greatest challenges. Um, and, and I'll echo Missy. I think that it was a very tight and clean presentation. Um, that we all have a good editor. Uh, uh, <laughs> here's a shout out to Matt Harper. He's, he's terrific. 
Awesome. Yeah. Um, it was a great reading experience. Now, um, I, I'm going to, I'm, I'm steering the ship in a different direction again, because I want to make sure we get this question in because, um, obviously there's an intentional timeliness to the release of this book. Um, like you mentioned earlier. Um, but outside of crime and, and, and law enforcement, you've also done work in a variety of areas, including, um, viruses and pandemics and stuff like that. So, um, before we started our official conversation, you mentioned, um, some of that work. So what's having, having the experience you have, uh, and, and the work you've done, how does, how, what's going on in your head about what we're going through right now? Well, this is, this is very interesting. Um, you know, I would like to say that I have planned out my whole career. Uh, I haven't it's, it's sort of <laughs> wanted to be a writer after college, and uh, it just sort of happened. I do come from a medical family. Um, my late father uh, was a doctor um, and a medical school professor. Um, both of my younger brothers are doctors, and one sister-in-law is a doctor. So wow. I, you know, I, I come by it. I'm, in fact, with my uh, wife being an attorney, I'm uh, I'm definitely the least educated person in my uh, in in my family circle. But be that as it may, uh, I also got interested early on um, in writing about uh, public health and epidemiology. Um, I wrote a book uh, back in the '90s, I guess, with a man named C.J. Peters, who was. Uh, the chief of special pathogens for the Centers for Disease Control. And if you remember uh, Richard Preston's bestseller, The Hot Zone, CJ was the hero of that um, in uh, fighting Ebola or Reston in, in Virginia. Um, and then three years ago, I wrote uh, a book called Deadliest Enemy with uh, our war against killer germs with Dr. Michael Osterholm uh, of the University of Minnesota. Now, the interesting, first of all, I'll give you the interesting story, which is we, the, book, the book was published in 2017, and it got good response uh, from the epidemic community. Uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, which is certainly one of the number uh, top ones in, in the country, if not the world, named the book the top global, the number one global health book of 2017. Uh, it sold very disappointingly, I think. Mm. Did not want to deal with the subject, which seemed so abstract and unlikely, and uh, uh, was kind of in the too hard box, if you will. Um, as of April of this year, 2020, this three year old book suddenly goes on the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list. So, um, you know, I don't joke much about uh, pandemics. Uh, the only joke I will give, if you will, is that all it took was a worldwide pandemic to make our book uh, a success. But, mm -hmm. you know, people do ask me, well, what's the, what's the connection between the work I do in criminal justice and the work I do writing about public health? And I think the answer is they are both detective stories and they are both life and death detective stories. Uh, and in both cases, uh, the detective, whether it's a criminal detective or medical detective, has to come to the scene and figure out all of the evidence, uh, which we're still trying to figure out, obviously, for COVID-19, has to figure out the evidence. And once you have the evidence, you can tell the story. And once you can tell the story, you can go about trying to solve the crime, if you will. So I find both uh, law enforcement detectives and disease detectives to be fascinating, heroic characters. And so that's why I write about this. And uh, I think one of the, uh, we've talked about some of the scary things about somebody like uh, Joseph Paul Franklin. I think one of the scary things about uh, uh, COVID-19 is because, uh, in fact, let me just diverge for a minute and say that our chapter about coronaviruses in uh, Deadliest Enemy was called SARS and MERS, Harbingers of Things to Come. It wasn't because we were particularly prophetic. It's just because we looked at the evidence. Uh, and mm -hmm. if people had paid attention to the evidence, I think we could have been a lot farther along than we are now in solving this. As it is, uh, this is probably the most serious worldwide pandemic that we've experienced, that 
the mankind has experienced since the 1918 to 1920 great influenza pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you would think a hundred years of medical science <laughs> and uh, development would uh, would have put us in great stead. But guess what? We are until we have a vaccine or some other really good therapeutics, we're basically using the same techniques that they used a hundred years ago mm -hmm. to try to control this in the meantime. So that's a very scary prospect. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, of all the tragedies that have come out of uh, the COVID pandemic, I think one of the greatest tragedies would be if we don't learn something from this one to prepare for the next one. And I assure you, just as I can assure you that there will be more crime, I can assure you that there will be another pandemic and it'll be bigger than this one. It may not be for, you know, it may not be for a hundred years, but it could come at any time. Yeah. yeah. True. It's, it's frightening. And I think, and so, on a different topic, but, but related, um, I'm getting a feeling of like, uh, so over the course of this year so far, we've uh, on the podcast reviewed probably 30 books or something. And two or three of them have to do with, you know, fictional pandemics. And so, uh, and then last year there was a couple as well. And so I'm assuming that means that pandemics just kind of pop up from time to time, uh, in general. But for me, they jump out in my head because it is, you know, it's the front page news now is, is so like I'm making that correlation in my head that probably isn't there, but it seems like it's a topic that's coming up at least in fiction, like pretty frequently lately. Well, I think it did. And, you know, Lawrence Wright, uh, who is a really good writer who wrote a pandemic novel this year, uh, did it long before COVID. Yeah. And he said that he was just basically looking at the same things that we were, which is the evidence. Um, what the pandemic novels or pandemic movies generally get wrong, though, and uh, a movie like Contagion, I thought, was was really good. But what they get wrong is, you know, usually there's some kind of outbreak uh, somewhere in the Far East and somebody gets sick and they don't really correlate it. And then they get on an airplane and somebody else gets on an airplane. And then the uh, emergency rooms start picking up things and. Is this related? I don't know. Let's call CDC. Gee, well, maybe we're getting uh, this is a pattern. Anyway, within weeks, of course, they know that they've <laughs> got uh, they've got uh, a major problem. People are dropping like flies. All the you know gyms and stadiums and everything become uh, mobile hospitals. Uh, the president goes on television, at least in in these things, and tries to <laughs> whatever and. Uh, and people are dropping like flies all over the world. Meanwhile, a plucky group of scientists is working around the clock in, <laughs> uh, in, in a lab to try to figure this out. And then one day, um, you know, about an hour and 15 minutes into the movie, he, he or she holds up a test tube and says, I think this is it. And so immediately it is rushed out into the field um, they inject it into somebody, they miraculously get better in about 20 minutes, and then the pandemic's over. Unfortunately, that's not the way it happened. <laughs> First of all, um, you know, we've all heard about the phase one, two, and three trials that you have to go through. But once we even get to the point where we have a safe and effective vaccine, which probably won't be a slam dunk like measles or smallpox or uh, polio vaccine. It'll probably be closer to the flu vaccine, which is partially successful. But it's going to take us months to ramp this up. And with all of the uh, with all of the doubt and the uh, skepticism that's been sown in this country, I, I almost feel like we're living in two different realities in this country. I'm not even sure how many people are going to want to take this vaccine when we have it. But uh, so, you know, unfortunately, I think we've got a ways to go on on this yet. And that makes me think about the people who aren't just even doing the basic preventative techniques of wearing masks and stuff like that. Um, and, and how much that's just exacerbating things. It's totally politicized. Why, why should a mask 
become a political symbol. And, uh, right. you know, I think one other thing uh, that relates to both of my fields of public health and criminal justice is we need to rely on evidence. Um, I can't tell you, going back to the crime situation, uh, we've written about cases like not only Ramsey, but uh, the West Memphis Three case, the Amanda Knox case in Italy. Um, and I've given lectures, I've talked to people, and I present all of the evidence. Evidence. That's all it is. Evidence. <laughs> and, and, you know, and then people say, yeah, well, I see what you're saying, but I still think they did it, or I still think she's guilty. So this is what we call confirmation bias. Um, mm -hmm. You think what you want to. And uh, I, saw a, um, I saw a pretty scary uh, statistic the other day, which is that 97% um, of the people who regularly watch Fox News think that the pandemic is overblown. And 90% of the people who regularly watch CNN think it's for real. Now, I'm not uh, either endorsing or criticizing either network. I'm just saying that it's scary to me that we have these different realities in this country. Yeah, it, that's that's the thing that's frightening is that it's not necessarily that one group thinks so extremely that way and the, one the other. It's the fact that like those two exist at the same time. And I feel like that divide is just being pushed further. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And to, and to bring this back to the killer's shadow, back in the 1970s and 80s, and even into the 90s, um, when uh, Joseph Paul Franklin was operating, uh, he had to get his information from pamphlets and meetings and things like that. Now we've got the internet, which promulgates any theory or any point of view you want. And one of the things that scares me at my age is I worry about the generation that has grown up with the internet, which I did not. And, you know, is every, uh, is every source on the internet the same to them. I mean, is are the New York Times, the Drudge Report equal in terms of their authority or or even Wikipedia for that matter? Uh, so, again, you know, it all comes back to show me the evidence. Um, and I think that to tie it back into the general conversation we're having, one of the feelings I had when Miss, me and Missy were talking yesterday about the book was that and and is probably you know, speaks to the timeliness of releasing the killer shadow is that that voice of like faith in facts and data is absolutely necessary. And it's something that not only needs to be taken seriously, but like needs to be um, like encouraged. So. Amen. The, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> so uh, I guess thank you for, for being one of those voices of, of reason and, and faith in, in, in the evidence, because um, we we could definitely use a lot more of that. Look, we all want we all want to encourage creative imagination, but it has to be grounded in in facts and reality. And you know, I again, I'm going to be aging myself, Rob. But uh, <laughs> uh, early on in my career, um, I was a reporter for the Washington bureau of the St. Louis Post Dispatch, uh, covering Watergate. And uh, young reporters and uh, students have asked me, well, what's the difference between what's going on now versus what was going on in you know, the situation in the 1970s, the Nixon administration versus the Trump administration? And without getting into characterization of either one of them, uh, here's what the difference is in, in my view, which is back in the 70s, when we had three television networks and every... Uh, and, and most cities had their own newspapers and they relied on the Associated Press and United Press International and Reuters. Um, we, we all had our own opinions and certainly the country was divided in a lot of ways, but we all kind of had to agree on the same set of facts because all the news organizations were presenting essentially the same sort of facts. Now, with the diversity of uh, news sources, 
both on television and cable and the internet and whatever, everybody's got their own set of facts. So we don't even agree on the reality anymore. And that's one of the things that really scares me. And that's one of the reasons I think Killer's Shadow is, you know, an important read right now. Couldn't agree more. Absolutely agree. Um, I want to respect the the timeline because um, we wanted to keep it close to an hour. Or so um, I'm probably just going to thank you for coming on and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Is that cool? Well, thank you. Thank you. You both are terrific interviewers. Uh, I'm always thrilled to have somebody who has read the book and gotten it. And uh, your questions couldn't have been more on point. So thank you. Awesome. Um, it, it, was, it was a great pleasure. Oh, my goodness. That was a tremendous interview. That's, I, it, and I say this every time we have a good interview, but you, you can just get a sense that um, that a person is going to be good in conversation. And I and I felt it going into this interview. But man, um, in addition to being like having an amazing and interesting life, this man knows how to talk, um, and that that came through uh, is very apparent in, in this conversation. It was it was wonderful. Absolutely, he was extremely generous. Um, with, uh, with his answers, uh, very detailed and, and thoughtful. Oh my, uh, I just, I, I can't say enough about, uh, what a fantastic interview that was and, and how grateful I am that he was willing to come on and, and spend that time with us. Yeah. Um, definitely keeping him on our radar for future episodes because, um, it would be amazing to read more stuff, but also, um, he, he's the type of person where I could definitely see having future conversations with him. Now, um, just as a reminder, uh, his book with John Douglas, The Killer Shadow, which we recently re- reviewed, uh, will be releasing a week from this the time this episode is is out. So November 17th is the official release date for that book. I, I strongly recommend it, and I believe, Misty, you probably feel the same way. Absolutely. So that's going to wrap it up. Thanks for joining us uh, for this awesome, amazing interview. We're still like bathing in the afterglow of it. So you could tell our, <laughs> our energy is still pretty high um, and uh, not really sure what's coming next. Uh, but I think Misty's uh, takeover of the podcast uh, is is done for now. But uh, you will definitely, I'm hoping, be joining us for our annual Christmas episode as usual already on the calendar all right (laughs) awesome well that's gonna wrap it up for this episode join us next week for probably livius talking about whatever he's been up to uh these last couple of weeks and until then i'm rob olson and i'm misty bennett keep reading